Call rise for town session. I will let Robert Kirk's bell presiding. Good morning, you may be seated. Okay. We're on the record in the matter of the state of Arkansas versus Cosmo Kramer, CR 2005-47-2. Stay ready for trial? Yes, Your Honor, we are. Okay. Defense? Well, defense is ready, Your Honor. Very well. Will the clerk call the roll? Marquise Boston? Here. Andrea Page? Here. Angela Smith? Here. Ryan Rainwater? Here. Teresa Barnett? Here. Jimmy Meyer? Here. Diane Lane? Here. Marcy Lawson? Here. Chris Dixon? Here. Lauren Brown? Here. Martha Cox? Here. Donna Holloway? Here. Brooke Little? Here. Patty Hill? Here. Jamie Raleigh? Here. Tiffany Gray? Here. Michelle Hill? Here. That's all you want. Very well. Will you swear the panel? Would the potential jurors please stand and raise your right hands? You and each of you do solemnly swear or affirm that you will true answers make to such questions as may be asked you touching your qualifications to serve in the case now pending. So help you God. Be seated. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Will you please uh, call 12 names? Andrea Pate will be juror number one. As you're seated, please go to the far back <coughs> row and seat one, two, three along the back row, and then come back and fill in the second row after when you get to numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. That's good. Actually, we need to move the chair down to make it even. So, next, Mr. Bailiff, if you don't mind, move that chair down if it fits for our worksheets. Thank you. Go ahead. Ryan Rainwater will be juror number two. Teresa Barnett will be juror number three. Angela Smith will be juror number four. Marquise Boston will be juror number five. Lauren Brown will be juror number six. <clears throat> Martha Cox will be juror number seven. <clears throat> Donna Holloway will be juror number eight. Patty Hill will be juror number nine. Marcy Lawson will be juror number ten. Chris Dixon will be juror number eleven. Jamie Raleigh will be juror number 12. That's 12, Tom. Thank you. Mr. Dixon, I see you have a, is that a Bluetooth? Yeah. Is it turned off? Yeah. Very well. It's off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Again, I'm going to 
read a summary of the information. Uh, the defendant, Cosmo Kramer, is charged with the offense of murder in the first degree. Uh, to sustain this charge, the uh, state must prove the following things beyond a reasonable doubt that with the purpose of causing the death of Jerry Seinfeld, Cosmo Kramer caused the death of Jerry Seinfeld. You should not, uh, reading the information is merely to let you know what the case is about and the defendant's name. You should not use that information as evidence of any guilt and or otherwise consider it other than to understand why you're here today. Okay. Uh, for the uh, for today's trial, we have Miss Rebecca Bush. Ms. Bush, please stand. Miss <coughs> Bush is a deputy prosecuting attorney and will be representing the state. And uh, Mr. Sandridge. Mr. Brent Standridge is representing the defendant. Thank you. And the defendant in this case today is this gentleman here at the table. His name is Cosmo Kramer. And there are three other witnesses that uh, you will most likely be hearing testimony from during the course of the case. Their names are Elaine Dennis, George Costanza, and Art Vandelay. And the attorneys are going to ask you more questions, but if any of you uh, that are seated or any of you who may be seated in a minute uh, know any of those witnesses or know the attorneys, uh, be sure and speak up when you're asked about that. Or, and also, uh, if, have any of you heard about this case on television or through newspapers? No. No. And if there's been a little bit of media coverage on this case, if as we go through the process, if you realize that you have heard something, <laughs> Please bring that to the attention of the court or to the attorneys asking the questions, and we'll go into some more about that at that time. Okay. All right. Ms. Bush. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> As the court stated, my name is Rebecca Bush and I'm the Chief Deputy Prosecutor of Fort Saline County. And it is my privilege to represent the people of the state of Arkansas and particularly those of Saline County. It's my job after the police have gathered all the evidence in the case to take that evidence to court and present it to either a, a jury, as the case may be in this case, or a judge um, under a different set of facts. So that's what our job is um, to do. This is the part of the proceedings that we like to call voir dire, and that's a fancy French term. It means to see and to speak. And this will be our only opportunity, um, the attorney's only opportunity, to speak with you one-on-one -on -one and to elicit your responses to some questions to determine whether or not this is the type of case that you can sit as a fair and impartial juror. Um, when you hear that, you think, well, you know, I'm a fair and impartial person. I can be fair and impartial. And I'm sure that you all are. However, there may be something about this particular fact circumstance that might make this case a little bit harder for you to hear fairly and impartially than it would for someone else. What I mean by that is if you had had a child that was killed per se by uh, a drunk driver, and this was a drunk driving case, then because of your past experiences, your life experiences, then it would probably be too much for society to ask, to ask you to sit on a, uh, a case that is so similar to what your life experience is. So it's those types of things that we are trying to elicit from you to determine whether you can be fair under this particular fact circumstance. There's no right or wrong answers. We just ask that you speak up, tell us what you really think, and that's important to us, is that you don't hold back and that you give us as much information as you have. Now, the judge read the witness list and he introduced the attorneys and the defendant um, without saying who you might know. Is there anyone who recognized any of those names or knows uh, any of those people? Okay. And I'm not seeing any nods, so I'm going to presume that, that no one knows the witnesses that are going to be called in this case. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit more about the factual circumstance in case there's something that triggers in your mind that you might remember, oh, I did hear about that. Um, so I'm going to give you some facts, and then after that, I'll ask you if, uh, based on these additional facts, whether or not anything in your mind has been triggered, whether or not you remember anything about this, reading about it in the newspaper, receiving an email, a, twit, a, a tweet, um, or anything such as that. 
The state alleges, and we anticipate that the proof will be at this trial, that on July the 2nd, 2005, officers from the Benton Police Department responded to a call at the Benton home of Cosmo Kramer, who is the defendant in court today. When they arrived, they found a Dodge Ram pickup, uh, which was a truck belonging to Mr. Kramer, and a Cadillac De DeVille belonging to the victim, Jerry Seinfeld, and that was in the driveway of the defendant's home. The truck was parked in front of the car, and the car was smashed into the back bumper of the truck. The driver's door of the car was open, and the victim was found in the driver's seat, slumped over the steering wheel. He was bleeding from a gunshot wound to the neck. When the police arrived, Kramer was standing in the middle of the front yard and he told police that Seinfeld was a crack pusher and that he had shot him. The victim later died from his injuries. Now, is there anyone based on that circumstance, which was a little bit more than just an allegation of murder, does anyone <coughs> recall reading anything about this particular um, incident in the newspaper, watching it on TV, anything like that? All right. So there's no one that has anything in their past experience, for example, that read anything for, um, in the newspaper that you could not put aside and fairly <clears throat> judge the evidence from just the witness stand, the, the evidence that we present, the witnesses that we put on, the evidence that the judge allows into to evidence. And, and that's what we're looking for, is people who can just decide the, uh, the case based on the information that's elicited in, in this court. Ms. Brown, do you think you can do that? Mm -hmm. yes. right. <clears throat> and you understand, Ms. Brown, that sometimes when uh, uh, the, the paper covers a, a trial such as this, they may have one column to fit in what happens in an entire day. And you sitting as a juror may remember something differently than what the paper um, puts in there and writes about this case. And the judge will instruct you that you're to decide the case from the evidence in court. Do you think you can do that? Yes, ma'am. All right. Does everyone kind of see where we're going with that? And will each of you agree that you will decide the evidence based on what you hear in this courtroom today? Yes, yes ma'am. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anyone here who's been the victim of a crime? Okay, I saw a couple of hands. Mr. Boston? My car was broken into. Okay, and when did that happen? Um, April 25th of last year. Okay, so that made a big impression on you because I can remember, you remember the date it happened and everything. Tell, uh, tell me, did you call the police? Yes, ma'am. And was that here in Benton? Uh, Little Rock. In Little Rock, okay. Yes. Did the police um, respond? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Were they able to make an arrest in, in that case? No, ma'am. Okay. How did that make you feel? Were you frustrated by that? I guess I just kind of see it as a part of life. When you're just living in society, then you just may be the victim of something. It's just the right. way around it. Right. Yeah, unfortunately, that's that's quite often the case, isn't it? But uh, I guess what I need to know from you is, is uh, were you unhappy with the police because of how they treated you or the, the fact that you didn't... Uh, you felt like they didn't do enough? Or do you have any animosity towards the police because of the way they treated you in your situation? No, ma'am. The city's finest were professional from start to finish. Okay. All right. And you understand, uh, Mr. Boston, that sometimes there are cases like that. You know, the burglar that went into your car may not have picked um, a time of day when there were witnesses all around that could have, you know, testified and said, well, we saw, you know, that defendant break into Mr. Boston's car. He probably picked a, kind, a time when there was no one around in the parking lot. So there, there often is not a lot that the police have to go on. Do you, do you understand that? Can yes, you accept that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you felt like you were treated with respect, no problems with the police? None whatsoever. All right. And I saw one other hand. Let's see. Was that Miss Holloway? <laughs> All right. Could you please tell me what you saw? What, what happened to you? My home was broken into two years ago, the week before Christmas in 2008, okay. and about $10,000 worth of items were stolen. Oh, my goodness. Same question. How, do you feel like you were treated... Um, fairly by the police? Do you think that they well, took your... It was the sheriff's office who investigated, yes. All right. Very pleased. Yes. Same thing. People that break into houses, people that break into cars, they don't typically do that when there's anyone around to testify against them. Um, did you think that the police did a good job? Yes. They right. never caught 
the criminals, but they did a good job. They, okay. But they, they didn't have anything to work with. So All right. No one saw anything. All right. So that past experience doesn't col color the way you're going to no. view the evidence in this case in no. any way. All right. Thank you. Now, you're going to hear as the judge reads you some instructions later on in the trial, you're going to hear the word reasonable over and over again. And I think a lot of times when people come into a courtroom, they expect that um, there's something magical that goes on here. And while we do have a very good system of justice in, in, um, in our country, um, we want people to come in and bring their common sense and experiences into the courtroom and judge the evidence based on their common sense and reason. Will each of you agree with me and promise me that you will use your common sense and reason in evaluating the evidence that you're going to hear here in court today? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Now, has anyone ever been a juror before? Mr. Boston, how long ago was it that you served as a juror? Uh, this is 2010. I want to say 2002. All right. Um, I don't suppose you all could look it up. Uh, well, that's not necessary. We don't have to have the exact date. But, you know, what we want to know from that experience is um, what kind of case it was. Um, this was a case where the way it was presented to us that this was a drug deal gone bad and this drug dealer um, was accused of stealing someone's car. Um, the drug dealer said that the car was payment for some drugs. So we had to decide if the drug dealer was telling the truth or not. Okay. So from what I'm hearing you, this was a criminal case. Somebody was charged with a crime. Yes, ma'am. All right. And, um, and you had to hear the evidence and decide whether or not they were guilty or not guilty. Yes, ma'am. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And um, did you happen to be the foreman in that case? No, ma'am. All right. Um, and then I saw someone else's hand over here. Who did I see that had also been a juror? Okay. I must have just saw something out of the corner of my eye that wasn't, wasn't right. Um, in hearing the evidence in that case, Mr. Boston, you probably heard the term beyond a reasonable doubt, didn't you? Yes, ma'am. All right. And beyond a reasonable doubt, there's that reasonable word again. We're talking about common sense and reason. Um, beyond a reasonable doubt is the standard of proof. And I anticipate that when the judge reads you the instructions, he's going to tell you that the state, which is, it is me, um, has to prove that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, we all watch a lot of TV. Uh, I know that you all probably watch CSI and all the other crime shows. That's kind of the, um, you know, it's a really popular theme these days and, and all of us watch that. Um, how many of you watch CSI? Okay. And you may have heard other, uh, I, I'm of a generation that I probably watch more Perry Mason than I watch um, CSI. But in Perry Mason, I can remember that the prosecutor uh, or the defense attorney used to say, beyond the shadow of a doubt. Um, but that's not our standard, is it, Mr. Boston? It's beyond a reasonable, a reasonable doubt. doubt. Okay? Because, Mr. Boston, if I was going to have to prove to you uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt that the defendant was guilty, you'd have to witness it, wouldn't you? Yes, ma'am. You'd have to see it with your own two eyes. Yes, ma'am. All right. Or I'd have to have a videotape. Yes, ma'am. And crimes often don't happen where there's a video camera. Would you agree with me? Since my car got broken into, yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> so that's what we have to prove. Now, in a civil case, if you're called upon to sit during your service as a, a civil juror, you'll hear the civil attorneys and they'll, they'll do a little thing like this where they have a way, uh, a, like a scale of justice, and they'll say if it tips just a little bit this way, then we've proven our case. Um, but that's not the same thing in a criminal case. It is beyond a reasonable doubt. If you have a reasonable doubt um, in the graver transactions of life, uh, such that you would have in a graver transaction of, of life, then we have not proved our case. So this is something that's really kind of internal. Uh, Ms. Pate? Do you understand or do you think you understand beyond a reasonable doubt that it's something in your heart of hearts, if you are convinced at the end of the evidence that you believe the truth of the matter asserted, 
that you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt? I believe so. Okay. Does everyone agree with me, or can you? Do, does everyone agree or uh, appreciate beyond a reasonable doubt? Can you accept and apply that law to this case? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Who among you um, has small children? All right, Mr. Dixon. I saw your hand go up first. Um, tell me how old your children are. Ten, ten, and eight. Oh my goodness! So you have <clears throat> twins, or no? I got a stepson and a daughter. Okay. And a son. That's All right. So ten is kind of right in that age where they're still deciding. They want to be a teenager, but they're still quite n not quite there. Uh -huh. And um, I've got an eleven-year-old, and and I can relate to the problems of that age. Um, do your ten and ten-year-olds sometimes get in arguments? No. They don't? No. How about the 10 and the 8-year-old? No. None of them argue? No. Wow. They're perfect children. They all get along great. Well, my goodness, I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> Does somebody else have a kid like mine that maybe not is not quite as perfect? <laughs> maybe that argues with their sibling? Anybody got more than one child? Okay. I knew I had a taker. <laughs> uh, Miss Raleigh, tell me about how old your kids are. 14 and 12. Okay. 14 and a 12 year old. Now, please tell me, do they fight? Yes. Okay. Um, now, how do you decide if, if one of them says, you know, brother knocked over the lamp, and then the other one says sister knocked over the lamp? How do you decide who's telling the truth? Um, they both get a chance to explain their story to me, mm -hmm. um, away from each other, and I compare the facts. Right. And I make my decision on who's telling the truth and the evidence. Right. What has happened. What kind of evidence might you look for? Oh, maybe. Okay. <laughs> maybe. Just, yeah. If it looks like a foot, probably a foot. Right. So. Looks like a duck, acts like a duck, right. quacks like a duck, right. it's probably a duck. Okay. And those are the common sense things that we do every day in life, ladies and gentlemen, in determining who is telling us the truth and who might be lying to us. You know, we look at their demeanor. Is that important to you? Yes. Do you, um, if some, if one of the kids has a big um, project or something that they want to do that weekend <coughs> and they don't want to get in trouble, might that be a motivation for them to lie? Do you look at all those things, the demeanor, the way they, you know, I, my little girl can't look me in the face when she's not telling me the truth, and that's a big indicator to me. Um, do you find that with your children? Yes. Okay. And do you find that generally with other people? Sometimes if they won't look you in the eye, you, you suspect maybe they're not telling you the sure. truth? Sure. Okay. And it's all those common sense clues that you have about um, judging your children's credibility or if somebody's trying to sell you a used car or if somebody is trying to, um, you know, just convince you of, of their position on anything. You have to decide who you want to vote for, who you're going to believe, who you're going to buy a car from. And all of those things are your, it's the same thing you're doing here in the, in the, ju in the jury box, and you're deciding who you want to believe. Do each of you understand kind of that the juror, you're going to decide what the facts are. The judge will tell you what the law is, but it's your job to, t to decide who do you believe, and you're going to do that just the same way as you would, you know, with your children and um, refereeing a dispute with them. Now, in Miss Raleigh kind of told me a little bit she's going to look for the shape of uh, the footprint on the wall or so. That's that's something that she's going to look at, and I believe that the judge is going to instruct you that there are different kinds of evidence in a criminal case. There are there's what is called direct evidence, and that's if, as we talked about, you viewing the Mr. Boston, if you had been there and you had seen somebody breaking into your car, then you would have been able to give direct testimony to a jury saying, I saw the man break into my car and he looked like this and that's the man sitting right there. That's direct uh, testimony. Circumstantial evidence is what you can reasonably infer from the circumstances. So Mr. Dixon, if you wake up on Christmas Eve morning and you go and you open the door and it's snowing and it's going to be a beautiful white Christmas 
and there are footprints going from the door to your car in the driveway. What can you infer from that? Well, it depends on a lot of different things. If I'm the first one up, then that would be, you know, kind of curious why there would be footprints from there to my car. But, I mean, if I'm the last one up and my wife's up and the kids are up, someone obviously walked my car. Okay. So Somebody. what's going on. Yeah, you may not be able to tell who, but you can tell if there are footprints from your door to the car that someone walked that way, couldn't you? Okay. Does everyone understand that sort of a uh, an easy example or an oversimplified example? But um, the fact that there are footprints in the snow typically will indicate that someone's walked through the snow and left the imprint of their foot. And that's just an easy example of what circumstantial evidence is. And sometimes that can be quite powerful. Would each of you agree with me on that? <coughs> Ms. Smith, as you can see, Mr. Kramer is an elder, elderly gentleman. He's um, about in his 70s. How do, you, how do you feel about sitting in judgment of someone who may be in their late 70s? I believe I can do it. I would be fair. All right. Um, so if I'm hearing you correctly, then you're saying that you would not necessarily feel more sympathetic towards him because of his age. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Is there anyone, uh, Ms. Pate, let me ask you this. Um, do you think that a person, even in their late 70s, should be held responsible for the actions that they take? Yes, I do. All right. Does everyone agree with that? Ms. Lawson, um, by the nature of this case, you've heard from the judge and then I've read a set of facts. Um, you may be called upon to hear some testimony that uh, may be medical, um, maybe from the um, medical examiner's office. There may be pictures um, describing wounds or uh, treatment that is given to a patient. Um, and, and he might be called upon to look at some pictures that would just be in common parlance would be kind of gruesome. Do you think that you would be able to rise to the occasion to look at it to satisfy yourself whether or not we've proved our burden or do you think you would be so inflamed by um, gruesome type photographs or graphic testimony that you think you just couldn't make a decision in this case? No, that would not bother me. Okay. All right. Does everyone else, I, I'm sure that none of us would, um, we would want to do that, but does everyone, and Ms. Balson, I'll come back to you. Does everyone else think that they could look at those photographs and still make a decision? If you had a question about the injury, you could look at those photographs and still come to a decision based on that, or do you think that you would be so put off by the pictures that you just couldn't deliberate? No? Mr. Boston, you had something you wanted to say. Yes, ma'am, I wanted to ask you, if the pictures are just extremely graphic, is there any way we could get a heads up? Just like, could someone describe it so that we know to expect this as opposed to just putting it on the screen and it's just kind of in your face? Mm -hmm. Well, I anticipate that you will probably know that those, those photographs are coming um, through the medical examiner, for example, who will testify about the cause of death um, and things of that nature, the crime scene photos that will be presented by the, um, the police officers. So, so through the course of the, the direct examination and the opening statements, I think you'll pretty much have a good heads up that those are coming. And if if that were so, and I've pretty much told you how they're going to be used in this case, do you think that you could still make a fair and impartial judgment? I could, but if I just didn't want to see them, then could I ask to be stricken from the jury so I just don't have to watch them? Well, no, and that's the kind of thing. I mean, once you're a jury, it's kind of like being pregnant. Unless something else happens that um, disqualifies you, then you're on there. You're either you're either a juror or you're not. Um, and if someone, of course, gets sick or something like that, then uh, with the judge's indulgence, we might get uh, an alternate, and they could be repl replaced for that. But for something like not wanting to be the evidence. Um, that's something we really need to know now. And if that's how you feel, then I really appreciate your honesty in letting me know that because that's important. I would not want to see graphic pictures. All right. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank we, you for your honesty. Can we, we want to address that now? Are you? 
Your Honor, I believe that we, it, Mr. Boston has been quite honest with us, and he has told us that he just simply feels like he would not be up to the task of looking at a, a photograph that would be gruesome. And for that reason, I believe that the state would move to excuse him for cause at this time. Mr. Sanders, do you have any response? Uh, I don't have any objection to that, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, Mr. Boston, thank you very much for your attendance today. You, you may be, still be called for another type of case, a civil case or another criminal case. I'm going to go ahead and notify the clerk if there's any kind of violent, uh, violent cases. You may not need to be called for that so we don't waste your time or, or take up any extra time. But again, I do appreciate your service and you are free to go. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just come on down. Okay. Madam Clark, would you call another yes, your order? Ms. Hill will be juror number five. <coughs> Ms. Hill, you've heard a lot of questioning up to this point, so I'm going to go ahead and see if we can kind of bring you up to speed. Did you understand the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt? Yes, ma'am. Um, did you have any problems with looking at the graphic photographs? No, ma'am. All right. Um, have you ever been the victim of a crime? No, not really. All right. And have you ever served as a juror before? No. Was there anything else that you heard of um, as a, we were questioning along? I don't want to go through the whole process again, but is there anything that made you kind of think, well, I probably need to mention this if I get called? Okay. Do you know of any reason that you can't be fair and impartial um, under these facts? Thank you. All right. I anticipate that the judge will probably instruct you on something that's called self-defense. and. Mr. Rainwater, may I please ask you this question? Does it make sense to you that the law only permits a person to use deadly force to avoid injury or risk to one's own safety? Does that make sense to you? Yes, ma'am. Do you think that's a good law? I'm object to that. I don't think that's a correct statement of the law. Your Honor, I believe. That's correct, Ms. Bush. There's other, other reasons to be used. Absolutely, Your Honor, but for the fact circumstances that we have, I think that that is an accurate statement for the, of the law as applied to these facts. I'm not sure it is, Ms. Bush. I'll move on okay. then, Your Honor. Sustained. The court is going to instruct you that one who provokes the conflict or who was the initial aggressor cannot claim self-defense unless he withdraws from the conflict. Mr. Rainwater, do you think you understand that? Can you read it again? Sure. The court will instruct you that one who provoked the conflict or who was the initial aggressor cannot claim self-defense unless he withdraws from the conflict. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And in fact, we probably all know that from the schoolyard. Would you agree with me that, you know, when we were young youngsters playing on the schoolyard, if there was a bully and he picked at the little kid, picked at the little kid, picked at the little kid, and the kid just gets enough of it and wallops him one time, well, he kind of pretty much deserved it, didn't he? The bully? Did the bully deserve it? Possibly. Okay. And my point is, that's just something that we, you know, we know from just being kids on the playground. You can't pick on somebody, pick on somebody, pick on somebody, and not expect that they might strike out in response. Okay, would you agree with that? Yes, ma'am. All right. Can you accept and apply that law? Yes, ma'am. All right. Can each of you accept and apply that law? Yes. One who brings on the conflict may not be able to complain later on if they are hurt. Right now, I'd like for the judge to please put up on the, um, the monitors, if we could, um, the statute. We talked about beyond a reasonable doubt, and now I believe that the judge at the conclusion of the trial will instruct you as to the definition of first-degree murder. I'm sorry. 
use the bottom button. Do the bottom or top, maybe top. It's, there it is. There it is. All right. Cosmo Kramer is charged with the offense of murder in the first degree. To sustain this charge, the state must prove the following things beyond a reasonable doubt. That with the purpose of causing the death of Jerry Seinfeld, Cosmo Kramer caused the death of Jerry Seinfeld. All right, so this is what the legislature has defined first degree murder as applied to this factual circumstance to be. So the law lets us know exactly what you're going to be called upon to deliberate. It tells you what things must be proven beyond a, re a reasonable doubt. Um, Ms. Brown, do you understand that if we prove that with the purpose of causing the death of Jerry Seinfeld, Cosmo Kramer caused the death of Jerry Seinfeld, we've met our burden of proof. Yes. Do you understand that? Yes, okay, do each of you understand that? Yes. So we don't have to prove, for example, if the defendant was wearing blue socks or mauve socks. There could be a reasonable doubt about that. We don't have to prove if it was a cloudy day or a sunny day. There can be a reasonable doubt about that. But we must prove that with the purpose of causing the death of Jerry Seinfeld, Cosmo Kramer caused the death of Jerry Seinfeld. All right, will each of you hold me to that burden and only that burden? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Now, there are some definitions that go along with this statute mm -hmm. and purpose. Purpose is a state of mind. A person acts with purpose with respect to his conduct or as a result thereof when his conscious object when it is his conscious object to engage in conduct of that nature or to cause such a result. So basically what that means is that he killed him and he meant to do it. Do each of you understand that? Um, Ms. Hill, how do you decide when you are trying to determine what is somebody's intent what are some of the things that you look at um, like pre-planning if they've thought about it before how do you tell intent. if they've thought about it before because we can't really open up right. their head and look in so how, how do you find that um, if it's something that's well planned like if he knew like if you know someone's gonna be home or something okay you've you've thought about it beforehand right so you, you planned on you planned on doing that act Right, Before so planning is important. Yes, ma'am. Um, sometimes by taking an action, does that let you know it's in somebody's mind? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if I take a big old um, heavy frying pan and I wallop somebody upside the head, then I know based on my common sense and reason that I'm probably going to hurt them pretty bad with that thing. Wouldn't yes, you agree? Yes, ma'am. So while I didn't say anything about it, my actions indicate that I had the intent to hurt that person. Yes, ma'am. Do you understand that it's those types of things that you will have to be called upon to, to determine what's in someone's mind? I always like to end with just a, a general question. Is there anyone that has anything, for example, we had Mr. Boston who was very honest about his, um, his uh, reticence to look at those pictures, and I appreciate that because this is probably not the case for him to sit on. Is there anyone else that during the questioning has thought of something else? Oh, I probably need to mention this, or there's something else that you feel is important for either myself or Mr. Standridge to know about um, in deciding whether or not you would be a good juror for this case. No? Well, then I appreciate your time and attention, and, um, and I'll turn it over to the court at this time. Okay. Do we need to take a break or do you want to keep going, Mr. Chandler? Uh, we'll just uh, rather keep going, Your Honor. Very well. Let's score. You may proceed. <coughs> may it please the court, counsel, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Brent Stanridge and I represent Mr. Uh, Kramer with respect to this matter. And as Ms. Bush said, this is the phase of the trial that we call voir dire. Uh, you hear that pronounced different ways. I think she said voir dire, which is 
a French pronunciation, which is what it really is, but at least in this part of the country, a lot of times we refer to it as vor dire. But whatever the fancy term is, it is a mechanism by which we use to select jurors. And in a normal case, I would probably not know any of you, and the only information that I would have to pick a jury would be based on juror questionnaires and the responses to any questions that I get from you in this court. And that's kind of the selected uh, method that we have to select jurors. So it's for that reason, my purpose is not to pry or embarrass anyone. It, and if it seems as though I'm doing that, I hope that you just hold that against me and not my client. But it's to obtain information. So the more information that you can provide to us, the better that we're able to make an intelligent decision as to whether you should serve as a juror in this case. We will exercise challenges. We have challenges for cause. You already saw that this morning. We also have peremptory challenges. Those are mechanisms by which the attorneys pick uh, who a juror is and who a juror is not going to be for this case. If you are challenged, that is not a personal attack on you, and please don't uh, interpret it as such. It's just the feeling that the attorney believes that you may not be right for this particular case. And we're human beings too, we can obviously be wrong, but please don't take that as a personal attack. One thing that I should mention, since this is an information gathering process, sometimes uh, a prospective juror will believe that it is important for the attorneys in court to know something, but they would rather not talk about it in the presence of everyone else. And that's fine. If, if you are one of those people or you do have one of those concerns, I believe that if you would ask the court to do so, uh, we could take the matter up in chambers outside of the hearing of the other jurors because we do want as full uh, and complete disclosure about these matters as we possibly can have. And if you have a concern, if it's important enough for you to think, you know, that's something I really want uh, them to know, then it's important for us to know it. So if anybody falls into that category and you want to give a response to a question or want us to know something, we certainly can take it up in chambers uh, if, if you want us to do that. <clears throat> now, I had mentioned jury questionnaires a little bit earlier, and again, before we select a jury, we review the jury questionnaires, which have some very general information on them about uh, who the person is and uh, you know where they work and some other general type of questions. And it's been a while since those jury questionnaires have been completed. Are there any of you here today who say that you know there is something on the jury questionnaire that you believe is different than it was when you initially filled it out or that you might think is not a correct response to any of the questions that were asked on the jury questionnaire? Does anybody fit into that category at all? All right, thank you. <coughs> you have been asked about whether you have heard anything about the case and You've heard the information read to you. Mrs. Bush gave you kind of a factual overview, a very brief overview of the case. I anticipate that the facts, as is true in a lot of these cases, are going to be contested. It's important to hear all the evidence before making a decision in this case. And we anticipate that the evidence is going to show, Mrs. Bush mentioned self-defense in the case, that my client was almost going to be run over by a car driven by the decedent and that's why he had to respond the way that he did. That's where the self-defense comes into play. But does everyone understand it is important to hear all sides of a story, everything about a case before you make a decision? If the judge so instructs you, do you believe that you would be able to follow that decision and apply it to this case? Thank you. Now, um, the list of witnesses have been read. The decedent in this case is Jerry Seinfeld. Do any of you know any of the witnesses or any of their family members at all? Thank you. There's been some discussion about, I guess you would say, pretrial publicity. And uh, I assume from what I've heard that nobody has really read anything about this case or heard about it uh, in the newspaper or talked about it in the coffee shop or anything of that nature. 
in my background is in journalism. I think it's important to have reporting of cases and all of that kind of thing, but it's quite different when you're a juror and you sit in a courtroom because you're there for the whole story. And will you all agree that that is the only way that you can arrive at a proper and correct conclusion is to hear the whole story? And does everyone understand sometimes when things get reported, you know, it may be somebody that listens 5, 10, 15 minutes of a trial, something like that, you're not going to get the full story. Are you all familiar with, with that concept? Thank you. Now, the attorneys in the case, uh, Ms. Bush has introduced herself. She worked for the prosecuting attorney, uh, Ken Cassidy. And then there are a number of deputy prosecutors in that office. There's Kerry Robertson, Chris Walton, Vince Shoptaw, Shay Mueller, Brian Clary, Mike Sappington, uh, Jeremy Hutchison. And then there's also a lot of the support staff people that work there. Do any of you know any of these individuals on a personal or professional level? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Martha Cox. I know Shay Miller. You, you know Shay? How, how do you know Shay? We attend church together. Would the fact that you attend church with Ms. Miller, would that cause you to believe that you could not be a fair and impartial juror with respect to this case? If you were to decide after hearing all of the evidence in this case that my client was not guilty of anything, would you feel compelled that you would have to explain that decision to Ms. Mueller in any way? No. Right, very good. <coughs> a anyone else? My name is uh, Brent Stanridge. I have a law office here in Benton and have a general practice of law. And uh, Ms. Pate used to work for me at one point in time. Now, Ms. Pate, in, in, when I single people out, I, I want you to understand I'm not trying to embarrass anybody or you put them on the spot or anything like that. It's just part of the process. It's important for that information to come out. Uh, Ms. Pate, by the fact that you used to work for me before, uh, would that cause you to believe that you could not be fair and impartial with respect to this case? I don't believe so. I hadn't worked for you in a while. Okay, very good. <laughs> And uh, Ms. Barnett, I currently work with you now. Is there anything about that? Uh, I mean, you're not my employee. We obviously just do work together. Anything about that that would cause you to believe that you could not serve as a fair and impartial juror in this case? I don't think so. And Ms. Smith, I'll ask you the same question. Anything, we obviously work together now. Is there anything about that that would cause you to believe that you could not serve as a fair and impartial juror in this case? No. <coughs> I believe Ms. Bush had asked whether uh, any of you had been victims of crime, and we had some responses on that. Have any of you had family members that have been victims of crime? Yes, Mrs. Holloway. My niece was killed by a drunk driver when she was 16. Okay. Now, this case will have facts that are quite different than that, but. By virtue of the fact that that did happen, that you had a family member that was a victim of a violent crime like that, would that cause you to believe that you could not serve as a fair and impartial juror in this case? No. Anyone else? One of the witnesses that was uh, mentioned was Officer Art Vandelay. And it's typical in many criminal cases, not surprisingly, uh, you'll hear police officers testify. They may have central roles in a case or they may have minor roles in the case, but they're still police officers. Is there anyone who believes that just by virtue of the fact that someone is a police officer, that you should give their testimony greater weight or greater credence than someone who is not a police officer? Do any of you have any, have any of you served or do you have any family members that have served in law enforcement? Ms. Pate. I have an uncle that's a sheriff for Garland County. With the fact that your uncle is a sheriff for Garland County, <coughs> would that cause you to believe that you would kind of favor the state or you would tend to believe a law enforcement officer's testimony more than you would the testimony of any other witnesses in the case? Not necessarily. Obviously, you'd want to hear what all of the facts and circumstances are before you made up your mind. Is that correct? Sure. The court will give you instructions. We have talked about some of those today, but in, in we really won't know what all the instructions are until all of the evidence is in and the judge gives you those instructions at the end of the case. 
Uh, and some people may hear an instruction and say, you know, I just don't know if I really agree with that or not. But what I want to find out is this. The judge's instructions are the law, and you're to apply the law to the facts and evidence of the case. Do all of you believe that you can apply whatever the instructions you get or the law, can you apply those to this case? Or would you say, I don't care what it says, I'm not going to pay any attention to it? <laughs> do, all, do we all agree that it is important when the judge gives instructions that are to the law that those instructions be followed? Yes. All right. <clears throat> Among the instructions that you will receive, Ms. Bush has talked about uh, an instruction on common sense, which I agree is a very important instruction. Uh, common sense has a place in almost everything that we do in society, and it certainly does when you're talking about a court case. I also anticipate you will receive an instruction that concerns a presumption of innocence, that when someone is charged with a crime, they're still presu uh, presumed to be innocent, and that presumption stays with them throughout the course of the trial unless and until their guilt is established beyond a reasonable doubt. Do all of you agree with that instruction? If the judge gave you that instruction, do you believe that you could apply and follow that instruction in this case? Another important instruction, and, and I want to say just because we're talking about a few of them, we're not trying to say the others are not important because all instructions really are equally important. But we want to point out a few that we think are particularly applicable to this case. Credibility of witnesses. It will be your job to decide what the truth is in this case. And to do that, you have to decide, well, who's telling the truth and who's not telling the truth. And you and only you get to decide it. You know, it's a function of the court to give you instructions of law. It's your job to decide what to believe and what not to believe. Do you all believe that you're capable of doing that? You know, that's a heavy responsibility. And, you know, it, it, it's a tough responsibility and, and it's a, a heavy burden to put on someone. But is there anyone who believes, you know, uh, this credibility of witnesses thing, if it's going to be tough and I really can't decide, I'm, I'm just not going to be able to decide one way or the other. Does anybody really feel that way or do you believe that you're capable of really uh, getting into a case determining where the truth lies? Can you all do that? Mrs. Bush had mentioned the uh, burden of proof in this case. The state has the burden of proof and that standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. And as she said, it's not beyond a shadow of a doubt or beyond any and all doubt, but it is beyond a reasonable doubt. And I anticipate that the instruction that you will receive will provide that if you're required to pause and hesitate in the graver transactions of life, that is when you have a reasonable doubt. So graver transactions of life, if I'm buying a house, if I'm buying a car, if I have to decide whether to have surgery in the hospital. Those are all grave decisions that we may have engaged in. And you may ultimately decide to buy the house, buy the car, have the surgery. But if you pause and hesitate in, during that process, that's when you have a reasonable doubt. Does everyone understand that process? Do you all believe that you can follow that instruction if that's the instruction that you receive on the burden of proof or on the standard of proof? It will also contain a uh, definition that says if you're going to find, if you're convinced of the defendant's guilt, you have to have an abiding conviction of the truth of the charge. That's the standard. Do you all believe that you can apply that standard as well? Ms. Bush talked about and it was put up there, um, murder in the first degree. That's what my client is charged with. It has components or elements is what we call them. Uh, you have a mental state. Uh, purpose was the mental state that was given. It has to be somebody's conscious object to kill. Ever how many elements that there are, because there may be other instructions that contain elements as well, does everyone understand that it is the state that has the burden of proving each element of a crime beyond a reasonable doubt? So if they just prove four out of five, Miss Smith, what would your verdict have to be? Not guilty. That's correct. <coughs> I'd also mention murder in the first degree. Uh, 
there very well may be other offenses as well that you receive instructions on. It just depends on how the proof develops. This type of charge is a homicide charge. So you could conceivably receive instructions on murder in the second degree, manslaughter, negligent homicide possibly. Does everyone understand that there may be a number of alternatives when it comes to a homicide that you may need to consider? Do you all understand that? That, that would not be surprising if that were the case because lots of times in homicide cases there are different alternatives that you'll have. We will actually have two different phases. We will have a guilt innocence phase and then, we, and then if you were to find my client guilty of some crime then we would have a punishment phase. This will be the only opportunity though that we get to talk to you and ask you questions. So I'm going to ask you some questions about punishment. I, I, but keep this in mind, I also anticipate the judge will give you an instruction that tells you that you're not to consider punishment when you go out and decide guilt innocence. That has to wait until the second phase of the trial if there is one. Having said that, murder in the first degree, I anticipate you will receive an instruction that that offense is punishable by 10 to 40 years or life imprisonment. Do each of you believe that you could consider that full range of punishment? Is there anyone who believes, you know, that's just not uh, an appropriate punishment for that type of offense and I could not consider that full range? Does anybody feel that way? You, you may receive an instruction on murder in the second degree. In murder in the second degree, I anticipate the court would instruct you as a class A felony, punishable by six to 30 years imprisonment and or up to a fine of $15,000. Same question, is there anyone who believes with respect to that offense that they could not consider the full range of punishment if, if you receive such an instruction. Right, very good. The next offense that you might receive an instruction on is manslaughter. And I anticipate that if you receive an instruction on manslaughter, the court will tell you that the range of punishment is three to 10 years imprisonment and or a fine of up to $10,000. Is there anyone who believes that they could not consider the full range of punishment with respect to that offense? Finally, we have negligent homicide. Negligent homicide is a class A misdemeanor. And it is punished by up to one year in the county jail and or up to a uh, $2,500 fine now. Uh, is there anyone who believes that that is not an appropriate range of punishment for a charge such as negligent homicide? If, does anyone believe that they could not consider a negligent homicide because there was a death involved? And you might say, well, a class A misdemeanor, I could, you know, if there's a death involved, that's never going to fit under any circumstances. Does anyone feel that way at all? All right, thank you. The judge read you the charge, um, and we charge in state court by information or indictment, usually by information as it was in this case. The prosecutor actually files that information. That's how the case gets started. I anticipate the court will give you an instruction that the information or the charge is not proof of anything. That is just a mechanism by which we get someone to trial. Does everyone understand that concept? Does anybody believe that, well, just because the prosecutor filed the information, this, my client must be guilty of something? Does anybody have that belief as we sit here today? <clears throat> this case, I guess is a fairly typical case. It is anticipated that it will take about one day to try this case, but it might go into a second day. Uh, we appreciate the fact that you're here this is obviously taking you away from your work and family and friends. It's, it's a sacrifice, I know, to be a juror. Is there anyone believes, though, that should this trial go into, say, two days, that uh, you would have some sort of business going on or something that you just could not do that? Does anyone fall into that category at all? Yes, Ms. Hill. I have children to pick up at 245. You have children to pick up at 245, okay. Then I think those kind of things the court can generally uh, accommodate. Uh, but sometimes we have people who say, you know, they have a, a business or maybe they have to take care of somebody who's very ill and so their mind really can't be focused, you know, on a case for that period of time. Is there anyone that falls into that category at all? 
Excuse me, Mr. Stanton. Ms. Hill, yes. do you have child care for the children? No. Okay, so you have to be picking the kids up at 245. Have to okay. You don't have any, do you have any other officers? Is there someone you could call? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I don't think they brought the. I don't think they kept the vehicle home today, in knowing that I was supposed to pick them up. Okay. Uh, does anybody, do either of you have any objection for me excusing Miss Hill? No, you don't. No, I have no objection. Okay. Um, all right, Mache Hill, um, another Patty Hill still on the jury. You're still on the jury, but Miss Mache Hill, you are excused today. Um, and uh, go ahead and call the clerk's phone. I think ne our next trial is scheduled for next Thursday, so just go ahead and call before then. Thank you. Is there anyone else that, while we're on that subject, that cannot? We got to finish the trial today. Maybe, maybe going tomorrow. Probably won't. Is there anyone else that has an issue about child care or an elderly parent or anything like that that they need to take care of? I expect Board Dyer will take another 10, or 10 minutes or so at the most, and then we'll have a break after that. But um, anybody else, that just we probably should have figured it out in this hill a while ago. And, but uh, anybody else, any issues like that whatsoever? Okay, all right, let's go ahead and Ms. Clark, if you could call another juror. <coughs> Tiffany Gray. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, uh, Ms. Gray, I'm not going to go through the whole list of questions that I've already asked the prospective jurors here, but is there anything about those questions that uh, I guess you have any questions about or that you have any concerns about anything that I have asked thus far? No. Is there any reason that you're aware of that uh, you could not serve as a juror if this actually went into a second day of the trial? One of the things, and you've already seen a little bit of this today, from time to time, attorneys will make objections during the course of a trial. Uh, we have reasons why we're making objections, and we may have a conference with the judge that's outside of the hearing of the jury. The process is not to try to keep the jury in the dark or to hide things. It's just that legally there are certain matters that the court may have to hear and rule on outside the hearing of the jury. And that's just part of the process. Is there anyone who has a particular problem with that, who believes, well, if somebody's objecting, you know, there's a, they're trying to hide something, or well, that's an improper thing to do. Does anyone have uh, that kind of a perception of an objection? I anticipate the court will also give you an instruction that says that objections and remarks of attorneys and that sort of thing are not to be taken in consideration by you when you go render a verdict. Do you all believe that you could follow that instruction if that instruction were given to you? Thank you. The other thing, we will not be allowed to talk and visit with you during the course of the trial. This is uh, our opportunity to, to ask you questions. We will be able to make statements. We'll have an opening statement and uh, we'll also have a closing argument during the course of the trial, but we will not really be able to visit with you. And uh, we may see you out in the hallway or coming into the courthouse, that sort of thing. Um, we can't visit, and it's not because we're antisocial or that we have anything against visiting. We like to visit as much as anyone, but it's said that, you know, a trial must not. Uh, be fair it must also appear to be fair as well and so if we were visiting about something that had nothing at all to do with the trial about the weather or whatever somebody might see that going on and say well you know they're they're talking there's something odd about that so just to be on the safe side the rule is we don't visit at all with jurors and won't talk does everyone understand that and is everyone comfortable that, with that process that yes. that's the way that it is thank you Self-defense was mentioned, and I anticipate that you will receive a jury instruction on self-defense. And Ms. Bush talked about uh, aggressor, uh, the, the, but the self-defense instruction will actually probably, there will probably be two or three instructions related to self-defense. And as she said, you know, 
not surprisingly in the law, uh, deadly physical force is only authorized to be used in certain circumstances. One of those circumstances would be where somebody reasonably, reasonably believes that their life is uh, in jeopardy, that they're about to be killed or seriously injured. Another one, which I anticipate the court would give you an instruction on, is if somebody is about to commit a felony on you or another person and that felony involves force or violence, then that would be a justification for a person to use deadly physical force against another person. Do you all understand too that it's the circumstances that existed at that time that are important when that decision is made? And does everyone understand, you know, hindsight's always 20-20. How many times have we heard that? Well, you know, if you have a long time to think about something or go back through something, you might do differently than what you actually did at that time. Has everybody been in that position before? And it's for that reason do you all agree that it's important to evaluate the evidence that existed at that point in time, what was going through that person's mind at that point in time that they alleged the crime was committed, that that's, what import, that's what's important? Mm -hmm. She mentioned the fact that my client's 70 something years old. And uh, when we talk about those circumstances, would you all agree that when a person is 70, they might react to a situation a little bit differently than say a person who's 20 or 30 or 40? Would you all agree with that? <clears throat> I'm just about to, to wrap up my voir dire here. Another instruction I think the court will give you is the fact that your verdict, whatever that verdict is, it must be unanimous. That means that all 12 of you must agree. It's a little bit different than it is in a civil case. This is a criminal case, so it has to be unanimous. Do you all believe that you can follow that instruction, first of all? Now let's suppose that we have a person, Ms. Lawson, let's say that you've heard all of the evidence and you've got 11 people and they're for this verdict and you're a one person, you say, no, you know, I've impartially considered everything. I'm not with that verdict, I don't think that's an appropriate verdict. Do you believe that you could vote your convictions in that case, or would you think that, well, you know, I should just go along with everybody else? No, I would say how I felt. All right. Anyone else? I mean, does everyone else agree with what she said? I'm not saying it's not important to listen to everyone. You know, we want people to, that's the whole part of what deliberations are about is, is listening. But if you get down to the end of it, and you know, you have that reasonable doubt, and you may be the only one can you hold your conviction? That's the question. Can each of you do that? Thank you. I'm going to ask what is a, a catch-all because uh, we as attorneys can't think of, of every question uh, to ask, but is there any question that I or Ms. Bush have not asked at this point about something that you think it's important for us or the court to know? You know, again, uh, if it's important for us to know, if it's important enough for you to think about that, hey, I need to tell them this, this is, it's important for us to know that. Anybody that has anything that falls into that category at all? All right, thank you. I thank you, I thank you for your time. Okay. Ms. Bush, anything else? Yes, sir. All right, uh, council approach. While we're coming up, just to let you know, uh, at this at this point in the process, the attorneys have, under the law, a certain number of strikes. They can strike they call peremptory strikes, and that means that they may, for whatever reason, for, for your answers or just any number of different things, they have the ability to strike you and 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 let somebody else serve in your place. That's why we have the board hour to make sure we have the very best jury possible. Uh, that does not mean that you should be offended. That doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong. Um, it's just one of those things. The, one, the way we do it here in Saline County is they're going to approach, we're going to go over it, and then I'm going out to, we'll get to go home or go back to work, and then we'll call some more folks if we need to. And some other counties, they do that, that out loud one at a time. Uh, I, my preference is not to do that because I don't want anyone else that remains in the jury to be uh, offended or affected by who might strike them. So uh, this will take just a moment, uh, and then we'll have a brief recess, um, and then we'll come back and we'll. Uh, finish up and get ready, ready for the trial. Do any of you have any questions before we go on to this? All right, thank you all. I'm going to approach. Everybody has one time. Turn my microphone off. Leave it off. Get the microphone off for the jury. 
Ms. Peggy? State. Mr. Rainwater. Good for the defense. Ms. Barnett. Good for the defense. Ms. Smith. Mr. Rex. Ms. Hill. Oh, she's gone. Ms. Hill. Ms. Hill. Ms. Hill. Ms. Hill. Ms. Brown. Good for the fence. Good for the Ms. Cox. Good for the state. Good for the fence. Ms. Holloway. Good for the state. Good for the house. Ms. Hill. Good for the state. Good for the fence. Ms. Lawson. Good for the state. Good for the fence. Mr. Dixon. Good for the state. Good for the fence. And Ms. Raleigh. Yes. Good for the state. Good for the fence. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, Ms. Pate and Ms. Smith are excused. Thank you very much for your service. Go ahead and call the clerk before next Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, we call two more names. Jimmy Meyer will be juror number one. Brooke Little will be your number four. Ms. Bush. Good morning. I'm just going to be directing my questions to Miss Little and Miss Meyer, um, and I know that you feel like you've learned a lot of law during listening to the other panels, and so I'm going to ask the most important question right now. Is there anything that you have heard during the last um, couple of hours that we've been going over voir dire questions? Is there anything that you would um, like to mention at this time, any reason that you feel like under these circumstances you just can't be fair and impartial? No, ma'am. Ms. Meyer, did you understand the um, burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt? Do you think you can accept and apply that law? Yes. All right. Ever been the victim of a crime? No. All right. um, ever been on a jury before? No. Miss right. um, Miss Little, how about you? Um, did you did you understand the concept beyond a reasonable doubt? Yes. And did you read the statute with us, um, the first degree mur murder statute? Do you think that's a good law? Yes, ma'am. Can you accept and apply it? Yes, ma'am. Um, and have you ever been the victim of a crime? No. Have you ever been uh, on a jury before? No. All right. <coughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Stanley. <coughs> Good Ms. Meyer, I'll ask you the same question that I asked Ms. Barnett and Ms. Uh, Smith. Uh, the fact that I do some work with you now, would that be any reason to cause you to believe that you could not be a fair and impartial juror with respect to this case? No. All right. And I'll direct this question to both Ms. Little and Ms. Meyer. You'd heard me to talk about uh, self-defense. If you receive an instruction on self-defense, do you believe that that is an instruction that you could consider and apply it to the evidence in this case? Yes. Do you believe, do each of you believe under the appropriate circumstances that use of deadly physical force in defense of a person is proper? Yes. All right. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Let me approach. Ms. Meyer. Good for the fence. And Ms. Little. Good for the fence. Very well. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have um, seated our panel. Uh, you are all going to be serving on the jury at this time. We're going to take a brief recess so you can call your uh, family members or work or whoever and let them know what you're going to be doing. Uh, as, as we take the recess, uh, I read you instructions earlier. 
and, and which indicate that you should not discuss the case with anyone else, should not discuss with the case with each other. Um, if anyone does try to approach you or act inappropriately in any way, please notify the bailiff, uh, Mr. Harris, or myself immediately, and we'll take proper action. Okay? We'll just take about a, say, 10 minute recess. We'll be back on the record at about 1 35 on that clock on the wall. Thank you all very much for being here, and uh, we'll see you in a minute.